Well, Father Steve asked me not to introduce him, so we have a mystery speaker today. <laughs> but, but I did have something I wanted to say. No, you have to stand here. I just want to share. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, there's a little secret that I want to share with you. He just revealed to me. And you know, a secret's no good unless you can tell about 80 people. <laughs> okay. This is a little known fact. We're identical twins. <laughs> no, it should be self-evident. That's why I wanted him to stand here. And the reason, the reason I know this, it was confirmed in January when we did a wedding together, okay? Now, my, my older brother, Steve. <laughs> Don't forget it. <laughs> he did the sermon. It was a good sermon. He did a very good job. But then afterwards, at least three, but maybe more people came up to me, his identical twin, and said, Father, that was such a wonderful sermon. <laughs> And I said, hey, this is cool. <laughs> I like this. So, happy to have you there. Thank you. Thank you. And, My right? My are best, yeah. In your ancestry. That's right. It is truly Greek. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Another victory for us. And he's talking about Ancestry.com. <laughs> you discovered there's a little bit of Greek back there somewhere. All right. So, I told his wife that explains everything. Okay. Um, so, um, as you know, we're going to be speaking about the Lord's Prayer today. And what I wanted to do was begin um, by reading something from St. Cyprian of Carthage, his commentary on the Lord's Prayer. He says, Dear friends, what mysteries we find in the Lord's Prayer. How many and how great they are, condensed in a few brief words, yet abounding in spiritual power. As new persons, reborn in our baptism, he means, and restored to our God by his grace, we immediately come up out of the waters and we say, Father, because we have already begun to be his children. Now, the Lord's Prayer for us, especially as Orthodox Christians, is the prayer. Um, and for us, one of the things that we need to understand is that the Lord Jesus very specifically thought and therefore taught that prayer can be taught. That you can learn how to pray and what to pray for and therefore how to live. And that's exactly why he gives us the Lord's Prayer. So some of you may recall that in Luke's Gospel, the Lord Jesus is praying. Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. And then, of course, the other place, that the Lord's Prayer is mentioned is in Matthew's Gospel. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, when you pray, say. And then he gives the text of the Lord's Prayer, uh, as we say at every liturgy. So at any given times, with at any given time, excuse me, with more than a billion Christians on the planet, there are hundreds of millions of people saying the Lord's Prayer on any given day in hundreds of languages, because this is the Christian prayer. Now, I need to make very clear at the outset that the early fathers of the church, the saints of the church, they believed that this prayer that the Lord Jesus gave to his disciples was, in a certain sense, a summary of the entire gospel. That when you said this prayer, you were literally praying the gospel. And it not only teaches us how to pray and what to pray for, but also how to live. 
because our prayer and our life need to match. They need to line up with each other. Now, at least for me as a child growing up, I don't know what it was like for you, uh, at least for me as a child growing up, I basically said the Lord's Prayer by rote. And, and what I mean by that is this. Um, it was the first prayer that I was ever taught as a child to memorize. I said it in Elizabethan English, most of which, or at least much of which, doesn't necessarily make sense to a 20th or even a 21st century child. You all know the story about the child who says, Our Father in heaven, herald be thy name. Because they don't know what hallowed is. Okay? So, a lot of times there's a lot of misunderstanding just in the type of language that we're using in English with regards to the Lord's Prayer. So we're praying this in Elizabethan English in a translation that, quite frankly, is sometimes inaccurate. We'll get to that in a little while. Not even paying much attention to the words or what they mean. We say the prayer by rote. The prayer passes over our lips, but never really touches our hearts and minds. And therefore, it never forms and shapes who we are as Christians, as being the Lord's disciples, which is what he gave the prayer for. Now, I would say that if you were to ask, what is a Christian? The answer is, or at least one possible answer is, a Christian is someone who prays the Lord's Prayer and really means it. Someone who prays this prayer, submits himself to Christ Jesus, prays as he taught us, and therefore lives as he taught us. And so I also need to say, because there's some confusion about this even among us Orthodox, the Lord's Prayer is the prayer above all other prayers. Now here's the part you might find difficult to believe, including even the Jesus Prayer. Because the Jesus Prayer, as important of a spiritual discipline as it is, is not the Lord's Prayer per se. It is not the prayer that came from the lips of the Lord himself. So I'm not minimizing the Jesus prayer as a spiritual discipline in the life of the church, but I am saying that of all prayers in the life of the church, the Lord's prayer has priority over them all. And that if we really want to learn how to pray, as the Lord intended us to learn how to pray, we have to pray the Lord's prayer, understand what it means, and live our life accordingly. Now, St. Cyprian of Carthage, again, I really like his commentary. He says that he who gives us life has shown us how to pray. He says this is why the Lord's Prayer is so important. He who has given us life has shown us how to pray. He has furnished us with a format for prayer. He himself has shown us how to pray and what to pray for so that we may be more readily heard as we speak to the Father in the very words that his Son taught us. And then he asked these questions. What prayer could be more spiritual than the one given us by Christ who also sent us the Holy Spirit? What prayer to the Father could be truer than the one framed by the lips of the Son who is himself the truth? And in a very ancient document called by, I think, most people in English, the Didache, Didache ton dodecor apostolon, we would say in Greek, the teaching of the twelve apostles. And most modern scholars date this document from roughly 90 A.D. to about 150 at the latest A.D. So it's a document that's written very soon after the Gospels themselves. The Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation were written. Uh, This document says that one of the defining characteristics of a Christian is that he or she prays the Lord's Prayer three times a day. That is the first known rule of prayer, that a Christian prays the Lord's Prayer three times a day. You know, I would mention just as an aside um, that this document, which some of the saints even thought might be part of the Bible, was lost for many centuries. And it was discovered in the last century, I shouldn't say that now, in the 19th century, in 1873, 
by a man whose name was Philotheos. He was the metropolitan of Nicomedia uh, in the Jerusalem Patriarchate while he was doing research there. So he actually rediscovered this ancient document that prior to his rediscovery in 1873, we didn't really have a text for that. We didn't really know what that was. Um, I wanted to say also that the reason that we are taught how to pray is because it is possible for us to pray wrongly. And we've discussed this, I think, here once or twice before, but I think it's important for us uh, to go over again. So, for example, notice what the Lord does not say here, which is so common when Americans talk about prayer. He does not say, Oh, it's okay. Pray in your own words. Say whatever you want to say. Just tell God what's on your heart. It doesn't really matter what words you use. No, he does not say that. When the disciples ask him, teach us to pray, he gives them very specific words to pray. He gives them the Lord's Prayer to pray. So we have a model in the Lord's Prayer that we are to use. And it's to be a model for all of our other prayers, all of our other prayer life. The late Father Thomas Hopko once said to me, and I think he said it in a series of sermons he did on the Lord's Prayer, he once said that all prayers in the life of the church are either abbreviations of the Lord's Prayer or expansions of the Lord's Prayer. But every prayer in the life of the church is tested by the Lord's Prayer. Now, there are two versions to the Lord's Prayer. Matthew's version and Luke's version are a little bit different. I'm not really going to discuss that a great deal today. Uh, We're actually going to focus on Matthew's version because it's Matthew's version that we use in our church services. And it's Matthew's version, really, that's used by really all Christians in their church services. So I'm going to focus really on Matthew's version. The only thing I'll mention is that uh, you should look up the Lord's Prayer uh, in Luke's Gospel. It's the opening verses of chapter 11. And I would just ask you to compare what's there with Matthew's version. Uh, Matthew's version is given in the Sermon on the Mount. And then... The Lucan version is given in what's called the Sermon on the Plain. So it's interesting for you all to kind of compare the two. Because again, as with the Sermon on the Mount, so in Luke's Gospel there are also Beatitudes, but they're also a little bit different. So it's kind of interesting for you to see those things. So in the middle of the 4th century, sometime between 347 and 352 AD, there was a bishop whose name was Cyril of Jerusalem, He preached five sermons the week after Pascha to those Christians who were newly baptized, explaining in great detail the meaning of baptism, the meaning of the Eucharist, and the meaning of the Lord's Prayer. So this morning, I'm going to try and imitate St. Cyril. And, by the way, many, many other saints uh, who preached on the Lord's Prayer. To give you some examples, I've already mentioned St. Cyprian of Carthage but St. Ambrose of Milan, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. John Chrysostom, St. Augustine, just to name a few. And I'm going to use their writings to explore the meaning of the Lord's Prayer. Now, in the opening line of the Lord's Prayer, the question of to whom we are to pray is immediately answered. We pray to our Father, who is in the heavens. Oentis uranis in the original Greek is plural. So what you have there, and we'll see this in a moment or two, is this dynamic between our intimacy with God and his transcendence. At any rate, then we ask and pray for six things after we have that opening. We ask for, hallowed be thy name. We say, thy kingdom come. We say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, one of the things you have to understand in Greek and that many people, I think, misunderstand in English is that when we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we think um, that thy will be done on earth 
the on earth as it is in heaven, modifies only thy will be done. But that's not really the case in the original Greek at all. So when in Greek you say, and you can hear it even if you don't understand it, aiasthito to onomasu, el theto ivasiliasu, yenithita to thelimasu, whenever you hear that, you can hear how it, I don't want to say it rhymes, but there's a rhythm to it. And then what breaks that rhythm is os and urano kepitizis. As in heaven, so on earth. The Greek is a little bit different in that sense. We look to heaven first, and then we say, as in heaven, so on earth. Um, so we pray for those three things. Uh, and this is really all about God's stuff, even though, of course, obviously it involves us. And then we pray, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now these last three things are more about our stuff, but obviously God is still involved in our stuff. So let's look just carefully for a moment or two, even at just the first two words of the prayer. And I need to mention to you, by the way, that it's only pretty much in English that the Lord's Prayer begins with our. In Greek, in Slavonic, in Latin, in most Romance languages, therefore deriving from Latin, the first word of the prayer is Father. So, but let's start with our. So, when we pray our Father, we're really saying something very important that runs against the grain of our entire culture especially for us living in contemporary America. The Lord's Prayer is definitely not a me prayer. In fact, the words I, me, my, and mine are nowhere found in the Lord's Prayer. I don't know if you've ever noticed that or not. But it is not a me prayer, but it's a we prayer. So that as soon as we pray this prayer, we immediately have to place ourselves in the context of the community of the church to which we belong. That we are not lone rangers in our Christianity, but that we belong to a broader community that's existed for 2,000 years, and we would even say before that, among the people of ancient Israel. So, we never say, my father. We always say, our father. And that's important for you to understand. Even when you're praying this prayer alone, in your closet, at your house, with the door shut, you never say, my Father. You always say, our Father. And that's very clear in the Gospels. Jesus says in John's Gospel that he is ascending to my Father and your Father. In other words, the relationship that Jesus has to the Father as his Son is unique and unrepeatable. You know, when we sing in the liturgy that he is, and we're just quoting John's Gospel, the only begotten Son of God, we mean, in fact, that Jesus' relationship to the Father is unique and unrepeatable. And it is we who enter into that relationship. And it's only because we can proclaim Jesus as Lord by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can enter into Christ's relationship with the Father. And we become sons in the Son. We become children of God because of the relationship that the Lord Jesus has with the Father, His unique relationship, which He opens up to us and embraces us and brings us to the Father. So, we never say, my Father, because that's uniquely something that belongs to Jesus alone. We always say, our Father. And we say, our Father, specifically because, if you want us to use this term, at this point in the Gospel, we are fundamentalists. 
We want to say exactly the words that the Lord Jesus himself said. So it's our Father, never my Father. Now, um, that really cuts against the grain of all the narcissism in our culture. And that's something really very difficult, I think, for us to understand as people. Um, If you look, and I know I've told my own people this many times before at St. Paul's, if you look at the history of magazines over the last 60 years, one of the things you'll notice is that their focus increasingly narrows. So that in the 40s and 50s we had Life magazine, right? All of life was to be included in Life magazine. People, places, things, everything one could encounter in life, right? But then, all of a sudden, by the time we get down to the 70s, you know, we've, we've lived through the 60s, now we're getting through into the 70s, all of a sudden, People magazine, right? No longer all of life, just people, okay? And then we're moving along in the 70s. We're becoming more narcissistic by each passing year. And then we get down into Us magazine. No longer all people, just us, which means there's a them that we have nothing to do with. Okay? And then finally, by the time you get to, I don't know, 1979, 1980, you get down to self magazine. And we've sort of been stuck there ever since. And so just praying our Father is an antidote to that kind of selfishness, to that kind of narcissism. Now, you may think that's not important, but really, analyze your own thought life for a moment. And I'm going to actually allow someone else to analyze your thought life for you. Uh, I'm sure that some of you have heard of Kay Warren, who is Rick Warren's pastor, at Sa- Rick Warren's, I'm sorry, wife uh, at uh, Saddleback Church. She wrote a book a number of years ago called Dangerous Surrender. And uh, she writes about contrasting, in our understanding spiritually, the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of me, which we are normally trying to build. And she says... Not only do I seek complete control of everything around me, but my greatest and deepest love is reserved for myself. I am desperately in love with myself. If I am completely honest, I have to admit that there are many times when I want the world to revolve around me. My comfort, my pleasure, my convenience. I desire that others make me happy, meet my needs, Refrain from offending me, hurting me, wounding me, upsetting me, or irritating me. I want to be understood, appreciated, acknowledged, elevated, praised, valued, attended to, catered to, respected, admired, accommodated, listened to, loved, adored, and cherished. My greatest efforts every day go towards myself. Now that to me is a remarkable passage that someone would have that sense of self-awareness. Because she is describing there perfectly what St. Maximus the Confessor calls the reason for the fall of humanity. And that was philaftia, literally love of self. And so when we are praying the Lord's Prayer and we begin with our Father, we recognize immediately that we're no longer about the kingdom of me, but we're about his kingdom. Thy kingdom come, we pray. So, um, whenever we pray, we immediately acknowledge that we are intimately connected to a community of believers, the church, the household, or the family of God. We are fellow citizens with the saints. St. Paul says all these things. And the body of Christ, of which we are Christ's members. Now, Sometimes when I use the word member, even when I'm speaking of the body of Christ, I realize that some people 
still think of that in terms of how we use the word member or membership in modern English. You join an athletic club and you become a member of the club. But maybe a better translation of this to emphasize more clearly how connected we all are, not just simply to Christ, but to one another in his body. We are limbs of Christ. St. Paul in the Greek says, Meli Christu, we are his limbs. We are his feet. We are his hands. We are his mouth. We are his eyes. And all of our life is to be lived in connection with all the different parts of the body. Which is one of the reasons why disunity is a sin. And forgive me, but all of our jurisdictionalism in America is therefore a sin. Now, we're connected to one another then in the most intimate of ways. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that flows through our veins and connects us all with one another. We are the household of God, the family of God, not because we are related by blood to each other, blood from this world, blood genetically, but because we all share in the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us on the cross and that we receive each time we receive communion. So we are connected, and that's what the Lord's Prayer emphasizes, that we are connected. Because the Lord Jesus did not come merely to save us individually. He came to save us as a community. That's why there are 12 apostles, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. So he came to create a community, and we are that community. So that even when we pray alone, we always pray in the plural. The Our Father. Now, in the liturgy, you may recall that when we begin to pray the liturgy, the introductory prayer is, um, we dare to call you the heavenly God, Father, and to say, in other words, this is something that takes courage to do. It's something that we have to be bold in doing. Because of whom we are addressing in prayer. In other words, through Christ in the Holy Spirit, we dare to call God, the creator of the universe, our Father. It's risky business to approach God. Why? Well, we need only to think for a moment of the immensity of the known universe. We need only to think about the fact that in our galaxy alone, there are a hundred million stars. That there are numbers too large for us even to begin to comprehend in terms of measuring the universe, understanding what the universe is, what it's composed of even. It is so immense. And this is the God, by the way, that in the liturgy we confess to be ineffable, invisible, inconceivable, incomprehensible, forever existing, yet always the same. That's one of the priest's prayers during the liturgy. Our God is incomprehensible. You need only to look up at the night sky in a place where you can see the Milky Way to begin to understand that. There are times when there are glimpses of beauty that enable us to see the mastery and the artistry of God. Um, God is incomprehensible. We can't begin to comprehend who he is or even what he is. He is inconceivable. We can't even conceive of what God is, according to our liturgy. We cannot wrap our minds around him and say, yes, this is God. We can't do that. He's invisible. Can't see him. He is ineffable, which is a word that means 
beyond the power of words even to describe. And that's why we use so many words in the liturgy. Okay? Because there's an ancient liturgical principle at work here. Why use ten words when a hundred will do? Okay? So we're coming at God in every possible way that we can because he has revealed himself to us. We can only address God as Father in Christ because of the Holy Spirit. So the prayer itself is Trinitarian. We're addressing God as Father in a prayer given to us by the Lord Jesus himself. But as St. Paul will say in his letter to the Galatians, he says, you are all, all of you, sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have all been clothed with Christ. God sent his Son that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has poured the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So, we can't even address God as Father without the Holy Spirit having been poured into our hearts. And so, you have to understand that this prayer, even though it's a prayer addressed specifically to God, is actually a Trinitarian prayer. By the way, just like the Jesus prayer. But anyway, um, the gift of the Spirit is the gift of conscious awareness of God's steadfast personal presence as the Father who is love. Not who has love, who is love. In John's first letter, he says, very bluntly, very briefly, very specifically, God is love. That means that all of the created universe, 100,000 million stars in our galaxy alone, with probably 100,000 million galaxies for all we know, was loved into existence by the one that we address as our Father. And not just Father in the... I guess I'd say more formal sense of that word in English. But Abba was a term of intimacy in Aramaic. The dialect of Hebrew in which the Lord Jesus probably originally taught this prayer. So that Abba could almost be translated as Papa. And that should be amazing to us. It should stun us to our knees every time we say the prayer. That the one who created all of this stuff including us, including whales, including hummingbirds, including, I don't know what, all kinds of stuff, that that is the God that we pray to as our Papa. And that He wants it that way. He wants it that way. That's why Christ has come. That's why the Holy Spirit has been sent. Because God wants it that way. He wants that intimacy with us. He desires us. In fact, St. Simeon, the new theologian, will even say, God desires us with a maniacos eros, literally a maniacal love, a crazy love. That's how much God loves us. His love, from our point of view, is crazy. I mean, let's face it, how lovable are we? You know? So, but think about it. Our Papa in the heavens, the one who is completely transcendent, whom we cannot even begin to think about, ever wrap our minds around, even speak about clearly and coherently, is the one that he has revealed to us can be called Papa, can be called Father, can be called Abba. That, that in itself is really, really amazing. Um, so, does all that make sense? Let's keep moving on a little bit then. So, hallowed be thy name. Ayastito tonomasu. The very first thing we need to understand here is that we can, and we often do, profane the name of the Lord by how we live our lives. And what I wanted to do is read to you, actually, from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. Because he talks there about 
basically how Jews and Gentiles all need redemption. But he talks about the arrogance of his people. Uh, He talks about how they think that they are certainly better than Gentiles. Um, So let me read that to you for a moment. Because I believe that his words can be applied to us in the church today. So he says here, So indeed, you are called a Jew and you rest on the law and you make your boast in God. Orthodox Christians are known to boast a lot. And you say you know his will and you approve the things that are excellent, having been instructed by the law. And you are confident that you are yourself a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You, therefore, who teach another, how do you teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you not rob temples? You who make your boast in the commandments of God, do you not dishonor God through breaking the law? And then he actually quotes a verse from the Old Testament. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So the very first thing that we as Christians need to understand is that it is possible for us to profane the name of God, to blaspheme the name of God by how we live. Whether we really live as Christians or not. Whether we really believe this stuff enough to build our life on this or not. And one of the things, quite frankly, that many people see, certainly in looking at us as orthodox, is that many times we are not who we say we are. In fact, we are just as messed up almost as everybody else. The only difference is, at least we know we're really messed up. That's our only hope. That's why in the liturgy and in all of the prayers and all of the services of the church, we keep constantly talking about being sinners. In fact, you know that prayer before communion. I believe, O Lord, and confess that you are truly the Christ, the Son of the living God. Okay, that's from Matthew's Gospel. I assume you know that. Who came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the first, on protos me. That's actually from St. Paul's first letter to Timothy. St. Paul confesses himself to be the first, the chief, the main dude among sinners. And that's why he was so powerful. Because he knew who he really was and that everything he was was all by God's grace. All by God's love. All by God's help. So for us then, what we have to do when we hear, when we say those words, hallowed be thy name, ask yourself, how have I profaned the name of the Lord in this past week? Or even just yesterday? Have I forgiven the people I need to forgive? Have I said to the people that I love that I love them? What actions have I taken that show my concern for those who are less fortunate than I am. Do you see how even hallowed be thy name affects how we are to live? So that's the very first thing. Um, We have to apply these words of Scripture. And as St. Paul will also say in Philippians, we are to live lives that are worthy of the Gospel. And if we don't, we do not hallow God's name. And in fact, Father Alexander Elkaninov, some of you may have heard of him, he wrote a book called The Diary of a Russian Priest. And he died in 1938. He was exiled from the Soviet Union under the communists. He says, the indifference of believers 
is something far more dreadful than the fact that unbelievers exist. Now, St. Cyprian of Carthage says, and you have to understand, to hollow means to make holy, right? St. Cyprian of Carthage says, we, are, we say, hallowed be thy name, not thinking that God is made holy by our prayers, but begging from God that his name be hallowed in us, that we who have been sanctified in baptism may persevere in being what we have begun to be. In other words, in baptism, we die and rise with Christ. We receive the Holy Spirit. We become holy. St. Paul says we are sanctified. We are justified, he says. In other words, when we say, hallowed be thy name, we're actually praying not that God will be made holy by our prayers. He will not be. He does not need our prayers. Rather that his name will be hallowed in us by how we live, by how we think, that we can persevere in the gift that's already been given to us in our baptism. And that we persevere to the end. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is very clear. It's those who persevere to the end that are saved. Because you can begin well, but end poorly. You can begin poorly, but end very well. And the examples that are given by St. John Climac, or St. John of the Latter, uh, are actually gospel narratives. He says Judas began very well, but he ended very poorly. The thief on the cross, John says, began very poorly, but he ended very well. He heard the words of the Lord Jesus, today you will be with me in paradise. Doesn't get any better than that. So we hallow God's name in two ways. First, we worship him. The word worship and the word worth in English have the same root. We worship what is of ultimate worth to us. Is God the one whom we worship? Or have we substituted idols for the one true and living God. So St. Paul, for example, will say that greed is idolatry. Greed is idolatry. Where do we live? Orange County. Isn't greed a key value here? Sometimes I think it is. You know, um, you ever watch this uh, TV show? I don't even think it's on the air anymore. Real Housewives of Orange County. You know, I watched a number of those programs because I could do whole sermons out of each one. <laughs> you know? I mean, look at those guys. And the sad part is, they don't even realize it. They don't even realize it. But they're wrapped up in basically what we would say, what St. Paul has said, is idolatry, greed. I quoted to you Kay Warren before from her book, so let me mention to you something that Rick Warren said that I think is also very wise. He said that in Orange County, people spend money they don't have on things they don't need to impress people they don't even like. That's pretty good. I wish I would have said that. You know? At any rate, we have to be careful not to worship the idols that our culture places in front of us. We have to be careful. Okay? Um, so we hollow God's name by truly worshiping Him, placing Him as a priority and not so many other things that we get wrapped up in. Second, we hollow God's name, as St. Augustine says, by becoming like the one we worship. We are to become holy as he is holy. Now that's just simply biblical. It's 1 Peter 1.16. It's from the book of Leviticus, chapter 20, verse 6. 20, I'm sorry, 20, 26. We're called to be saints, St. Paul says in his letter to the Romans. 
we're called to be saints. So we hallow God's name by becoming like him, by becoming holy. And you know that the word holy, H-O-L-Y, and the word that in English we now pronounce whole, W-H-O-L-E, are intimately connected in terms of their roots. To be holy is to be a whole person. Because without Christ, we are just simply broken, fragmented, schizophrenic in our thinking, divorced from reality in every possible way. It is only in Jesus Christ, we believe, that you can become a whole person, that you can begin a journey that leads you towards wholeness, which for us is also holiness. So, St. Cyprian of Carthage again, it's very funny, he says, since we call God our Father, let's remember to act like children of God. You know? St. Gregory of Nyssa will say, we dare to call the immortal God, the one who is perfectly just and perfectly good, our Father. We must give evidence of our kinship with him by our way of living. So, we hallow God's name by who we worship and that we truly worship him and then also by how we live. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. These words flow pretty easily from our lips time and time again. And actually, as you know, saying the Lord's Prayer by rote, we really we don't think about it too much. In fact, the, the phrase almost sounds trite. It's just three simple words. But actually, these words are among the scariest in the Lord's Prayer. Because when we pray, thy kingdom come, we're praying for the eschatological, that's the fancy theological word, is a Greek word too, by the way. We are praying for the eschatological coming of the Lord's kingdom, the opening of the six seals, the coming of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and the lake of fire as described in the book of Revelation. The day of judgment that's described in Matthew's gospel when every man, woman, and child will stand before what St. Paul calls the dread judgment seat of Christ. And so I think just to remind you of some of the things when we say thy kingdom come, I want to look for a moment just at chapter 6 of the book of Revelation because we do think that this is a large part of what we're praying for when we say, thy kingdom come. When he opened the second seal, I heard a second living creature saying, come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace away from the earth, that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for denarios and three quarts of barley for denarios. And don't harm the oil and the wine. In other words, economic terrorism, among other things. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard on the fourth living creature say, Come and see. And so I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And the name of he who sat on it was Death. And Hades followed behind him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, and with death, and by the beasts of the earth. When we say, Thy kingdom come, that's part of what we're praying for. We're also praying for the last judgment. And all of you should be very familiar with that passage from Matthew's Gospel. It's Matthew chapter 25. In fact, we named the whole Sunday after it. It's called Judgment Sunday. It's the Sunday before the Sunday of forgiveness. And in that chapter, the Lord Jesus talks about the fact that when the Son of Man comes in his glory, surrounded by the holy angels, he will call all peoples to himself. Now notice... All peoples, not just Christians, everybody. He will call all peoples to himself, and he will separate them out, sheep from goats. 
And then what are the criteria by which that separation is made? Because neither the sheep nor the goats seem to know why they ended up as sheep or goats, right? The criteria that the Lord Jesus sets down is feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, giving drink to the thirsty, right? You know this passage, right? How then have we lived our lives in such a way that we can honestly pray thy kingdom come and mean it? That's a key to unlocking the door of this petition. How have we lived our lives in such a way that we can pray this petition and mean it? Which means that we have to be active in doing what is good and right and true. There's no no way around it at all. But, again, thy kingdom come. The kingdom is not just simply something for the future. We need to be fearful, in my opinion, when we pray this prayer. But we also need to recognize the fact that the kingdom, in a certain sense, has already begun, already come in the person of Christ and in the life of the church, which is the body of Christ in the world, of which we all constitute limbs. So the Lord Jesus will say, seek first the kingdom of God. So one of the things that praying this prayer means is that we have to get our priorities straight in this life. We seek first the kingdom of God is what the Lord Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. What's interesting also is that in Luke's Gospel, Jesus will also say, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. And in fact, many of the saints will talk about the heart as the center and core of who we are, and how in our hearts there is a whole universe. Angels and demons. All of the kinds of emotions and things that we feel, positive and negative. There's a whole universe that's there that we have to deal with. The kingdom of God is within you. We have to, at a certain point in our lives, turn our hearts completely over to God. And as St. Isaac of Syria will say, we have to turn our hearts over to God in order that He may sit on our hearts as His throne. So that He rules our life seated on the throne of our hearts. And so there's a certain sense in which by living a certain way, by living towards the future, this is important for you to understand, because we as Orthodox, we always talk about living towards the past. We talk about the fathers of the past. We talk about the mothers of the church in the past. But Orthodox Christians also live towards the future. We also live towards the coming kingdom. And so it's important for you to understand that in the life of the church, we remember not only the past, but the future. And in fact, one of the prayers that's prayed in the liturgy that the priest prays has to do with the fact that we remember Christ and His crucifixion, His resurrection, His ascension into heaven, right? His his seating, sitting, excuse me, on the right hand of the Father, and then we say, and we also remember His second and glorious coming. Which is why when we do the liturgy, we are actually, in a certain sense, receiving a foretaste of the kingdom still to come. And we are actually eating and drinking at the marriage supper of the Lamb that's spoken of in the book of Revelation. So, thy kingdom come... Thy kingdom come has two aspects to it. You need always to remember that we are praying towards the future. But we are also praying towards the future in such a way that we live our lives according to the gospel now. And that on the day of judgment, contrary to what anybody else might say, we will be judged by what we have done. The Lord Jesus says that 
St. Paul says that. The book of Revelation says that. Anybody who tells you any differently is wrong. Period. It's all over the Bible. You can't miss it unless you choose to. And unfortunately, far too many people choose that. Now, um, on earth as it is in heaven, remember, it modifies all three of those things, right? Os en urano actually is, as in heaven, so on earth. In other words, our goal as Christians in life is to make this earth function, to make us function, to make our communities function as if they were in heaven already. And so we look to heaven as our model for how we are to live, what our communities are to be like, and how we are to affect the world around us. And as in heaven, so on earth, modifies all three. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done. Okay? Give us this day our daily bread. You know what? How am I doing on time? I'm not doing very well on time. I'm supposed to be done by now, aren't I, Kevin? I'm, I'm moving slow, baby. I, I will speed it up. I am so sorry. You cannot summarize the entire gospel in one hour. Okay? Um, give us this day our daily bread has always been understood. I will speed it up. Forgive me. Because um, I do want to be respectful of your time. Give us this day our daily bread has always been understood in at least two ways by the saints. Spiritually and literally. So let's deal with the literal first because that's what John Chrysostom, for example, will say. Literally, our bread for today is actually what the Lucan version says, the Lucan version of the Lord's Prayer. And that harkens back, and I'm sure the Lord Jesus meant it to be so, it harkens back to the manna given to the people of Israel as they're in the desert, in the Sinai, as food. Right? Now, how many of you here have ever been to the Sinai? There is nothing there. I mean, I used to think Southern California was a desert. It is nothing compared to the desert of the Sinai. There is nothing there. There is no way on, I started to say on God's green earth, but God's green earth is not there in the desert of the Sinai. There's no way that those people could have found much to eat. And God gave them food from heaven. He gave them the manna. Now, notice what happens with the manna, though. It's only good for one day, right? And in fact, some of the ancient people of Israel, I mean, re remember, they're out in the middle of nowhere. There's like, there's no water, there's no food, there's no nothing. When this stuff comes, they want to gather up a little more. Let me save a little extra for tomorrow, right? But then it rots before tomorrow comes, right? What is God teaching the people of Israel there? To be what? Speak up, it's okay. To be dependent, right? Completely dependent on God for even their food. So give us this day our daily bread is about fostering that sense of dependence in us. That we trust God enough that he will provide for us whatever we need. And that's something that's really, really difficult to do. That kind of radical sense of independence is also something that the Lord Jesus speaks about on the Sermon on the Mount. He says, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. Lord, do you know what I got going tomorrow? What's the matter with you, Lord? Come on, baby. Give me a break here. We're all anxious about tomorrow. But part of the Lord's Prayer is learning that sense of dependence on God in such a way that we trust him to provide whatever we might need for tomorrow. Um, you know, I wanted to, to read to you, if I can, um, from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. 
because it's exactly that kind of dependence that St. Paul um, talks about there. And he's talking about how he rejoices in the Lord. And then he says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be humiliated, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then that famous phrase that so many people quote out of context, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In other words, if we depend on Christ to strengthen us, to be the source of our life, to be completely dependent on Him, whether we are poor and hungry, or fat and sassy and rich, whether we're abounding or humiliated, we will be content. And you have to understand that this is something, this kind of attitude is what sustains Paul when he receives the 40 lashes minus one, right, that he speaks of in 2 Corinthians. You know what the 40 lashes minus one is? If they whipped you 40 times, in all likelihood, you would die from being beaten so brutally. But if they whipped you only 39 times, you would suffer a great deal, but you wouldn't quite die. Yeah, that happened to him four times. The 40 lashes minus one. He spent the day and a night floating in the Mediterranean Sea because he was shipwrecked, right? It says he was beaten with rods. But he had that sense of complete dependence on God that we pray for here. Give us this day our daily bread. That he got through all of that. And it's only when people finally cut his head off that his mouth was silent and he stopped preaching the gospel. But through all of that, he depended on Christ for everything. And that's what the Lord Jesus is trying to get us to do. Um when we talk about uh, give us this day our daily bread. Now, um, the other thing I'll just mention to you is that we cannot then pray for luxuries. Give us this day our daily bread. Does not mean, as I said here once before, this very sweet lady who has since passed away once asked me, can I pray to God that my husband will buy me a mink coat? And I said, no. When we ask for our daily bread, it does not include mink coats. Okay? Um, it does not include, as Janis Joplin used to sing, I'm really dating myself now, oh Lord, won't you please get me a Mercedes Benz? Okay? It does not include, to be honest, a lot of the things that we take for granted. At St. Paul's, we just dug 10 wells in Tanzania. Thank God for Adam Musigwa. And we brought clean water to 10 villages that didn't have it before. We go, we turn on a tap here, or we turn on a tap at our home, clean water comes out, we can drink it, it's no problem. Whole villages of people, actually 10 villages is about 25,000 people, now have clean water for the first time. So they don't have to bend down in a mud puddle and try to get that water out and drink it. Okay? So we have to have, I guess I'd say, a sense in which, how do I say? We have to be so grateful for every second that we have. Every second that we have. And especially when you think we're born and living here. Not in a village somewhere in Tanzania where you don't have clean drinking water, and your body is riddled with all kinds of parasites, and you're sick all the time because of what you've been drinking. You see? So to be grateful, to be grateful also 
is about give us this day our daily bread. So that rules out for us, by the way, anybody who preaches the prosperity gospel. So if you're listening to Joel Olstein, you should be ashamed of yourself. You know? Um, you know, there's another guy, and I, forgive me, I'm probably making fun of people, and I shouldn't, but I'm such a sinner, I'm going to anyway. So there's a gentleman whose name is Creeflo Dollar. Very appropriate name, Dollar. He just bought a, uh, a Gulfstream jet. And uh, it's the most expensive private jet in the world. It costs $65 million. I can see Jesus flying around in it right now. Anyway, no. Um, it costs $65 million plus two to three million per year in fuel and maintenance costs. Okay? Um, and this is how we mask our greed. Okay? This is how we mask our greed. This is actually an official statement from the Creeflow Dollar Ministries. We plan to acquire a Gulfstream G650 because it is the best. And it is a reflection of the level of excellence at which this organization chooses to operate. We, the World Changers family, so value the lives, the safety, and the well-being of our pastors and leaders that we wish to provide to them the best air travel experience possible. I don't even want to say how blasphemous that is. But that's idolatry of the worst kind. It's greed of the worst kind. Now, just some quick... uh, counter uh, understanding of things. So $65 million, and then 14,254, that's the number of six starving, uneducated children who could be sponsored by the Protestant organization Compassion International for the next 10 years. You would provide food, education, I mean, all kinds of things. Um, You could add another 5,482 children just for the fuel and maintenance costs. That's 19,736 kids who could have food, clean water, clothes, shelter, education, and the gospel who currently do not because he spent his money on a Gulfstream jet to have the best air travel experience possible. Okay? So I am, um, and you know, Father Wayne is a really nice guy. He's not nearly as harsh as I am. But, but this to me is just, it is profaning the name of God. It is blaspheming the name of God. It is the worst kind of idolatry, the worst kind of greed masked as Christianity. It is not orthodoxy. It is not the truth. And you have to be very careful. Because sometimes people can say things in such a manipulative, deceptive way that we can become confused. So for example, when I was a priest in Seattle um, in the 80s, you may recall there was uh, Jim and the late Tammy Faye Baker. And they were Pentecostal Christians and they were on the air all the time. And I don't know if, I mean, some of you are old enough to remember this. Uh, Some of you are not. But Tammy Faye would be crying all the time that they need money to come in so that they can do certain things. And they got many, many millions of dollars. Many millions of dollars. And I would go bless the homes of very nice, sweet people from Greece. And they would say to me, Oh, Father, we gave some money to, you know, Jim and Tammy Faye because they need money to help people and so forth and so on. And unfortunately, I had read too much, and I knew that they had taken those millions and they had built what essentially was a Christian amusement park, right? So I had to do a whole sermon about this in terms of how we are to give. Just because someone says they're Christian and asks you for money on TV does not necessarily mean that they're going to use it for good ends or that they're even Christian, even though they might use the name Jesus. 
They might mention the Holy Spirit. They might even say, God is my Father. Once they say, my Father, you know they're wrong. (laughs) Right? So, I said, look at this. Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, God rest her soul. Jim is back on the air in the Ozarks, by the way. Remarried and back on the air. Selling survival kits for the rapture, for those left behind. Uh, At any rate, you you have them asking for money. And in a world where, at that time, the statistics were roughly... 45 to 50,000 children died every day of malnutrition, bad water, so forth and so on. They built, with that money, a Christian amusement park. On the other hand, you have Mother Teresa. She's in India. She's picking up dying people off the streets herself. She never asks for money. Did you ever notice that about her? She never went on TV once saying, oh, I need some money, please send me money. Never did that. In fact, people would ask her to fundraise for her, and she would say, no, you give money, but no, don't go asking other people for money for my sake or for the sake of the work. So what I said was just simply this. The Lord Jesus says... You will know his disciples by their fruits. So you got Jim and Tammy Faye in a world where 45 to 50,000 kids die every day. And they're building a Christian amusement park here in southeastern America. And then you have Mother Teresa, who's actually in India, where the poor people really are, among many other places, picking up dying people off the streets, never asking for money. Who should you give money to? Obviously, Mother Teresa. All of my little Greek people said, yes, that's wonderful. You know? but, but they didn't understand. They thought that if someone uses the words Jesus, Holy Spirit, God, that, that they must be good people. But that's not necessarily the case always at all. Even among the Orthodox, by the way. Okay. Anyway, so give us this day our daily bread. Excludes all prosperity gospel nonsense. That's how you literally understand it. Spiritually, you understand give us this day our daily bread because many of the fathers, that word epiousios in the original Greek is a very unusual word. It's unique in Greek, uh, found only in the New Testament. And in Latin, uh, in the Vulgate, originally it was translated super substantialis, um, which is a literal translation, actually. But um, it means uh, kind of a bread beyond all being. A bread greater than being. And many of the saints took that word and applied that to the Eucharist. Applied that to communion, which, by the way, is one of the reasons why, to this day, in the liturgy, we pray the Lord's Prayer. Do you ever notice this? Just before communion, right? Lord, give us this day our daily bread, literally also means, according to the fathers and saints of the church, give us yourself, because you are the bread from heaven. That's what Jesus calls himself in the Gospel of John. I am the bread that came down from heaven. I am the living bread. I am the bread of life. And so the saints understood the Eucharist to be the fulfillment of the manna in the Old Testament given by the Lord Jesus to us. To give us not simply bread that we need for today and for this world and for this life, but bread that we need for eternity. Because when we eat and drink that bread and that wine, we already are pointed towards our destiny in eternity. And eternity finds a home in us because Jesus has found a home in us. So hopefully, hopefully that all makes sense. 
Um, I will move very quickly now. I'm sorry. So give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Um, Just moving very quickly. That's the wrong translation. It does not say in the original Greek, trespasses. It says, debts. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are in debt to us. So in Matthew's text, in the Sermon on the Mount, it's very clear, and it's not trespasses. Where does trespasses come from? Well, it comes from the 1549 Book of Common Prayer. And it has stuck, and I don't know about the Antiochian Archdiocese, but in the Greek Archdiocese, that's now the official translation for all parishes. And it's trespasses instead of debts and those in debt to us, or debts and debtors. Um, so, but the Greek does not actually say that. It does say, um, it does say debts. So we're to forgive those who are in debt to us, hoping that God will forgive us, our debt to him. Where does the Lord Jesus explain that most clearly? He tells a parable, a very specific parable about that. Do you all know what that is? The parable of the unforgiving servant? Do you know that parable? So you know the story, right? So this guy, he's a slave. He's a servant. The Greek actually says slave. He's a slave. And he owes his master so much money. In fact, the actual amount is larger than the amount that the Romans used to manage the entire province of Palestine at the time of Christ. So it's a totally unmanageable debt for anybody at that time, certainly for a slave. He owes his master this huge amount of money. And he comes before the master and he says, Lord, I will pay you. Just have mercy on me. And the master forgives him all of his debt, a debt he can never, ever possibly repay. He could not make enough money if he lived a thousand years to pay that debt off. The master forgives it all. And then he goes outside. He sees a fellow slave who owes him like, I don't know, let's say 10 bucks. He says, pay me what you owe me. I can't do it. Please, just give me a little time. I'll get you the money. No. I want it now. And of course, in those days, what you do to get a debt back, they had what was called, in uh, English about 400, 500 years ago, debtor's prison. Right? So if you could not pay your debts, your wife and your children were sold into slavery and you went to prison. It was as simple as that. So he's willing to do this to this guy who owes him, let's say, 10 bucks. When he had just been forgiven this huge amount of money. And that's how we need to understand, through that parable, what's being said in the Lord's Prayer when we say, forgive us our debts as we forgive those in debt to us. Because his fellow slaves, seeing this, go to the master and say, hey, this is what this guy did after you let him off. And you know how the story ends, right? How does the story end? The not-so-nice slave does not end too well. He's judged. But notice here, so it's about money. It's about money. And, and money um, is the focus for a lot of people's lives, right? And so we have to understand how much we've been forgiven. And in fact, I would even go so far as to say that we probably only forgive other people as much as we ourselves feel forgiven by God. If we have any sense at all about how much we've been forgiven, oh my God, 
We'd forgive everybody. But you know, we hold grudges for years. Did you hear what that person said about me? Oh. And then we don't speak to them or have anything to do with them for years. For years. And then we try to poison our children about them and our other family and friends about them. You know, we go on and on and on. I mean, look, we're sinners. That means, as my dad used to say, that we are sinful, stupid, and wrong at least 99% of the time. I always thought that was a good definition of sin. So, so you have to understand that there's a condition on God's forgiveness, by the way, at least in the Sermon on the Mount. And again, we read this on the Sunday of Judgment. So it's important for you to hear. So he says, forgive us. And then he goes, for if you forgive men their trespasses, paraptomata is the Greek, so it's different than ophilimata. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Okay? So we have to forgive. I mean, there's a real paradox here. You know, Father Hopko used to say, orthodoxy is paradoxy, right? Um, so there's a real paradox here. We're forgiven! But we're forgiven by someone who says to us, now you have to forgive other people that will only forgive you as much as you forgive others. We're totally forgiven. And yet, in a certain sense, you almost have to earn the forgiveness that you've already received and been given. It's like you're paying it back. You know? But paying it back in the sense, how do you say, paying it forward? You're paying it forward. You're paying the forgiveness you've received forward to someone else. And then God says, that's the kind of child I want. I forgive you even more. You see? And orthodoxy is like that. It's not one or the other. It's both and. Almost always. Almost always. Um, so forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. St. Augustine, by the way, will say that that also is one of the scariest hmm, one of the scariest things uh, about the Lord's Prayer because he knows, having lived in North Africa, that people found it very difficult to forgive anybody else's trespasses against them. Um, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one or from evil. Now, I won't go into the differences there. I would say... Although, although it can be translated as deliver us from evil, my tendency is to want to translate that as deliver us from the evil one, deliver us from the devil, deliver us from Satan, deliver us from the adversary. And I think that lines up with the rest of what the Lord Jesus says in the Gospels. But this one phrase I do want to talk about, lead us not into temptation. Um, God does not lead us into temptation. You need to be very clear about that. That's, in my opinion, a very bad translation. In fact, James writes in his letter, never when you've been tempted say that God sent the temptation. God cannot be tempted to do anything wrong, and he does not tempt anybody. Everyone who is, a t who is tempted is attracted and seduced by his own wrong desire then that desire conceives and gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it too has a child, and that child is death. Remember St. Paul, not St. James now, I just read you St. James. St. Paul says the wages of sin is death. So there are some translations of the Lord's Prayer now who um, translate that as do not allow us to be put to the test. Don't allow us to be put to a test that we cannot bear. You see? Um, does that make sense to you? But you have to be very clear. That's a very bad translation, even according to the Scriptures. 
Yet that's the English translation we've had now for hundreds of years. Right? So lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Um, Satan is the accuser. Satan is the one who is our enemy, the adversary. He's the one we need to be delivered from. And yes, you can also say deliver us from evil in general, because it's, it's a neuter uh, word. Tuponiru is neuter. Um, but somehow, to me at least, evil one fits the bill better. Um, and then, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. That's not added to the text of the Lord's Prayer until the didache. Okay? The first time any kind of doxology appears after the Lord's Prayer is in the didache, which we talked about before. So, Father Wayne, I should shut up now because I'm way past my time. Oh, my gosh. You're very patient. Um, I am way past my time, and I apologize to you. Um, do you all have any questions about anything? So let me mention two books, uh, and I've got a couple copies here. Um, Our Father, by Father Alexander Schmemann. Uh, if you've not read this book, please do so. Um, these are a series of short sermons by Father Schmemann that were actually broadcast into the Soviet Union in the 1970s um, by Radio Free Europe. And it's a nice little book of meditations. Then this is more detailed. Uh, because it's actually intended to be uh, not a series of radio broadcasts, but an actual book, Reflections on the Lord's Prayer by Daniel Sejas. So if you want to, you can buy these books. Uh, I have given you, by the way, a copy of St. Maximus the Confessor's commentary on the Lord's Prayer. Uh, it's one of the shortest commentaries that the fathers of saints wrote. Uh, it's also, in some ways, the most theological. Um, so I thought you should have that. Uh, so you can just take that away. Uh, any other, are there any questions at all? I would think I've beaten you into submission verbally. Um, so, okay, Kevin, if that's it, out, okay. <laughs> so, anyway, so thank you all. Christ is risen. God bless you all. Thank you for coming out today.